Right, welcome back. I hope you've enjoyed this morning and your lunch. We are going to have a session now on how do we bring about long-termism in financial markets. Firstly, let me just introduce myself. My name's Helene Winch. I joined the POI on Saturday. My new role is Head of Policy and Research. And as I say to everybody, I'm new. Be nice to me, please. I very briefly just wanted to share a story about the last time I was in South Africa. It was a little bit different today. I was playing soccer at a student soccer tournament up in Bloemfontein. So a slightly different audience we have today. So with that, let's start. Can we introduce the panel, please? Sandy, would you mind starting? Hi, my name is Sandy Frucher. I'm vice chairman of uh, NASDAQ OMX. Uh, I do what uh, most vice chairmen do, weddings, farm vistas, funerals. Uh, <laughs> But in addition to that, um, I uh, am the corporate officer who is uh, the internal advocate and external uh, advocate for sustainability. I'm Erica Carr. I am the CEO of uh, a new company, although I have some, um, some time on you. I'm seven years old uh, at Cornerstone Capital Inc. We are arguably the next generation of an investment bank because the mission is to do fee-based, sustainable capital introductions. Um, and I had spent the last 25 years or so at uh, big Swiss investment banks, most recently running um, Global Sector Research, the UBS Investment Bank. Good afternoon. My name is Tabo Khujani. I am the Managing Director for Africa at Investec Asset Management. Uh, and speaking of soccer, I'm also a very big fan and big supporter of uh, Bafana Bafana, which is the local soccer team here in South Africa. We'll have game later, shall we? Elias Masilela from the Public Investment Corporation, the PIC. Uh, we have no option but to think long term, not because of the mandate from the GPF only, but because we're managing workers' funds, people who have a long term view in terms of their lives. So we have to match those. Good afternoon, my name is Diane Radley. I am the Chief Executive of Old Mutual Investment Group. We are an African asset manager and we manage assets on behalf of all investors across all asset categories and in all time frames, short term and long term. Thank you very much. Now I thought we'd try and do some audience participation. I'm just conscious it's post lunch, so I need you to all be moving your limbs around, to remain awake. So I'm going to ask you a question, and if you wouldn't mind raising your arm, and I'm sure we'll have someone counting. So this morning we heard a lot about long-termism. We heard from the Ministry that we need to have a long-term focus and we need to take a long-term view. We heard from Shambhal that all about patient capital and about how long-termism is so important to avoid another financial crisis. So what I would like you all to think about and raise your arm is, is long-termism better? So, does anybody agree with that? Does anybody think it's better? Okay, that's pretty much everybody. So, hands down. So, who thinks it's worse? Do we have any people hands? Okay, well, that's fine. We can go home. It's all done. But Helen, isn't that like asking a question whether or not long-term marriages are better than short-term marriages? Okay. Who thinks long term in marriage is better? No, we're not going to do that today. So, what maybe it would be interesting to ask all the panelists what's your view on that? Do you think long termism is better? Should we be bringing about long termism in the markets? Are there opportunities? And maybe this is one for you, Sandy, considering the business you're running, making money from every stock that's traded. What's the other side to the argument? In what instances is short termism better? Well, I don't think it's a question of better or for worse. I think it's a question of different. Um, you know, there's an old expression, different strokes for different folks. And, you know, there are some people whose model is to be short-term, and there's other people who are long-term investors. So the question really isn't whether or not one is better than the other, because uh, that's a sort of a philosophical question. Companies should have long-term strategies. But on the other hand, they have quarterly investor goals. Uh, so the answer really is, how do you get people to think about investing on a long-term basis? That, you know, riding with a company over a long period of time is a better way to get asset appreciation than churning the market. Now, 
The stock exchange has um, you know, two, multiple, but we have two uh, ways of looking at the world. Uh, the rationale for a stock exchange, or one of the rationales, is capital formation. And so our job is to provide a market where companies can come and uh, present themselves, and people will invest in the company, and that, that investment will then go for the long-term growth and the enhancement of the strategy that they have laid out. Um, on the other hand, you're right. Uh, we don't make money on an IPO on the day of the IPO. We make money on the volume of trade that company creates. We make it, we're very transaction oriented, so we have different, uh, different views about different things. But in the long, the long term, in terms of the economy, in terms of uh, value, one looks at long term investment and long term strategy as a very, very positive thing. The question is how do you get that information out to, the, to that segment? of the investing public that's interested in long-term investment? And how do you get others to look at long-term investment as an asset? Okay, good. And could you want to have an answer how you're going to think about this in your new company? Yeah, well, the, the truth is I, I agree with Sandy. I think it's not better or worse. I think it's different. What I think is problematic is the use of, of language in a kind of judgmental, definitive, potentially divisive way. So I don't actually care for this debate because, again, it becomes divisive. There is nothing inherently wrong with, you know, short-term, you know, stat arm, algorithm trade, whatever, if the systemic risk is managed reasonably well and we have good transparency. That said, I think it's really important to extract value judgments from different people's values and strategies. We talked a little bit earlier about the language and the language of sustainability, whether it's SRI or sustainable investing, double bottom line, triple bottom line, impact investing, values-based investing, creating shared value. That's Professor Michael Porter's. You know, they all are, are good. That said, some of them have an opposite, and the opposite is implied to be bad. And I think that's really problematic, and again, it's divisive, because the reality is this needs to not be about this being the integration of environmental, social, and governance excellence into the corporate uh, behaviors. This needs to not be about ideology. It needs to be about pragmatism. It doesn't need to be about values. It needs to be about creating value. And so I think any debate um, like long-termism versus short-termism, I, I hate to say this, to some degree, I think it can be a waste of time. I think it's a question of pursuing excellence um, without creating externalities that are damaging to some stakeholders. Sounds like we need to send a postcard to the minister then, who, who was talking earlier. Um, no, no, no. Yeah. Different strokes for different folks. If you're the minister of a country, you have a long-term view, almost eternal. So that's, that's the whole point. If a minister did not think long-term, they should get another minister. But then if investors find it so difficult to do, we're not going to be able to invest. So it sounds like someone wants, wants to get. How, does, how do you guys cope with this? Yeah. For an investment manager, uh, Delaine, time horizon is primarily a function of the client mandate. Uh, what is the client trying to achieve? What is the result they're looking for? Uh, how do they think about risk? Um, and so if, if a client is looking for a, a result that's benchmarked against an index or against a peer group, and the way they think about risk is in terms of volatility or tracking error, then the horizon will be slightly shorter. Uh, typically, a rolling 12 months or a rolling three year uh, horizon. Um, however, if the client is looking for an absolute outcome, a benchmark against cash or against inflation, and the way that they, they think about risk is not in terms of volatility or tracking error, but in terms of uh, capital loss, uh, then the, typically the mandate will give you a much longer horizon with, within which to make that possible. Um, and I think the reality is that the longer the horizon the investment manager has, the easier it is and the more likely it is that they'll be able to, if they're skilled, they'll be able to, to uh, meet the requirements of, of the client. So I, I would have to agree with Sandy and Erica that it's not a question of better or worse, uh, but clearly a longer horizon um, makes, it, makes it easier uh, to, to make money out of the process. That's an interesting viewpoint. So 
we'll come to this a bit later, this kind of idea about who should be pushing the market, and you're almost saying that it's pension schemes problem for not giving you the right mandate. That's an interesting one. What's your view? You yes. obviously have got the right mandate. May I go back to the question of the language then, before I answer your question? We've just come back from the Leaders' Summit in New York, and therein were people more than twice this gathering here. Twenty percent of the participants of that summit were thinking short term. And they stood up and argued that their business models forced them to think short term. For whatever reason, they think like that. Then a question was asked, do you plan to be in business in the next 20 years? <laughs> and the answer was yes. Which means even though people are thinking, are acting in a short-term fashion, underlying whatever they are doing, they have a long-term intent. This is simply because shareholders have a long-term interest in the investment. They don't have a short-term interest. So if you don't match the interest of the shareholder with what you're doing, the likelihood is that you're not going to be in business anymore. And there was a concept that had to be dealt with at the summit. And I brought my iPad so that I can read word for word here. We had to deal with the concept of private sustainability finance. The first 20 minutes, we didn't know what we're talking about until we agreed to define the concept. It's only after we define the concept that there was a lot of convergence in the room. And this was the definition. Betting long term, betting green, and investing right. And what that means is that in everything you do, you make sure that you put the economic case ahead of the commercial case. Because if you compromise the economic case, you may not be in business tomorrow. Secondly, you invest for growth, which is inclusive in nature. Generate jobs to reduce poverty. And the logic behind that was, if you invest and ignore the environment within which you invest, the likelihood is that your investments are going to tend to not in the near term. Therefore, it is extremely important to take cognizance of the environment in which you, op you, you operate. That means you then need to take a conscious position of not degrading the environment within which you operate. Whether that is short-term thinking or long-term thinking, what is key is that you don't try to maximize profit at all costs. Because if you do that, you may not have the opportunity to make profit. That was the logic that came out of the discussion. And I thought it is important to raise that, 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 that thought here because it, it's likely to inform the post-2015 agenda with respect to the Millennium Development Goals and what we do in contributing to that. Now, coming closer to home, the concept of sustainable investing or ESG to us, we think that that is intertwined with your day-to-day decision-making. You cannot do the E without the S and the G. And the reverse is true when you look at the others. What, is, what typically happens is that we tend to focus a lot of attention on the governance side of ESG. Ignore the social and the environmental. And that always comes around to bite us. When you look at Arab Spring, the source of Arab Spring is ignoring the E and the, and the S. Marikana, for a lot of people, they'll argue the same, that it is because there was an emphasis on the G and less on the S and the E. And what that means to us is it is important or very, very critical that as you think about investing, you need to think about how sustainable that investment is. It cannot be invested for today. It has to be invested for the future so that future generations and inherit 
and investment that makes sense to them as well. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Diana, conscious you haven't spoken yet, would you also like to kind of maybe mention a bit about this idea of definition? So, of course, we've gone straight into the debate, like a bull in a china shop, like I usually am. We haven't defined our terms. Maybe if you could talk a bit about timescales and how you think about long-termism, as in, is it a day, is it a week, month, um, as well as kind of your view on long-termism with an old neutral, that would be really interesting. I think maybe if I can just go back a step, the debate about short-termism and long-termism for me is not about one or the other. It's about and, because some investors do have short-term horizons and others have long-term horizons. And ultimately, this is dictated by the goal they ultimately have. I firmly believe that capital is predominantly long-term capital because most of us save for retirement and goals that are at least 20 to 40 years out. And therefore, we have the luxury to be able to use the capital to build true wealth while creating sustainable changes in the world. For me, a case in point, and we talk about um, time spans and how do we measure investment. Long-term investing for me is very much about how we create the alpha of tomorrow. So Sandy did talk a little bit about you know, churning the market and creating short-term alpha. But for me, short-term alpha is not acceptable if it compromises long-term beta. Because that's the alpha that needs to create the alpha of tomorrow. Simple example, we talk about long-term in the private equity industry as being between 8 and 10 years. But in reality, in developing continents like Africa, private equity plays a very strong role in the deployment of capital to provide infrastructure and wealth harnessing opportunities for family-owned businesses. And this gives rise to another leg because the ultimate outcome of private equity is the creation of capital markets as exit mechanisms in, in private equity funds naturally end, or quite often end, in, in listed markets. So this is an opportunity creating another opportunity for intergenerational wealth and us to be able to leverage alpha from one opportunity to another. So I don't think there's a simple answer about what is long-termism. It's about how do you actually think further than the long-term you have as an investment horizon. But how do we manage the goals of what the ultimate liability is to match the asset outcome that needs to develop the wealth to address that, that liability goal? I put a very simple question to you today is for all of us, we talk about water, the sustainability of water. We talk about energy, the energy requirements globally. We see renewable energy on the horizon being adopted in many countries. But the reality is, if I told you now that in 50 years' time, you would be charged for the rays of sun you use, would you do something different today? You know, those are, I, I agree with what you just said. And I certainly agree with the principles and the morality that you espoused before. Um, the, the real question uh, isn't how you buy people into moral positions. Uh, the question is how you entice them into those positions. Now, you're an asset manager. You're growing into one. And I'm sure the room is full of people who manage pension funds. Now, it's interesting because the objective of a pension fund is to maximize the return for the pension year. And if it's a government fund, how to reduce the cost on an ongoing basis to the government in terms of their contributions so that the fund will produce enough return so that it can reduce the obligations on the part of the government to continue to fund the pension. It, there's nothing in it about other uh, moral standards or goals. It really is about return. Asset managers are not really judged over 10 years. They're judged every year by what their returns are. So it's a very complicated, it's a very complicated series of choices that people have to make. And the question is how you choose people to make investment choices that are long-term. And how those investment decisions are made such that all of the various issues that sustainability encompasses are incorporated. I'd like to just yeah. interject. Please. I, I actually don't think it's just about the investment choices. 
I think it's about the management of any organization. I think the values, the priorities, and the inherent conflicts um, with things that all have to get done right. are really where it starts. And I'm going to change the direction. No, no, and I, I agree, agree with you. With you. I agree but, with you. Your but, but the issue of long-termism, which if as a group we argue that that's more constructive on the environmental, social, and governance progress path, um, it has to be driven from the top. And, and every piece of the capital markets and every incentive structure that sits inside each piece, from the asset owners to the asset managers to the investment banks to the consultants to the accountants to the exchanges, we have to look at the incentivization towards behaviors that allow for um, an expression of priorities for you know whatever stakeholder we're talking about, right. whether it's a trader, whether it's a portfolio manager. But when one decides to you know, push certain agendas. Um, this issue has to come very much from the top. This is part of culture. Uh, um, and this is more than just about the investment process. It's about priorities. Should we split the amount of cozy chat up at the end? Yeah. Don. I was going to raise the issue of incentives. I think incentives are extremely critical. You're right, we cannot use a stick to change behavior. But the fundamental question is, where should the psychological change start off? And in my view, it has to start off with the owners of the capital. If owners of capital are short-term, you cannot expect the agent to wake up one morning and be long-term in the way they do business. So we need a new principal agent model that is going to drive us in a particular direction. And uh, how do you get uh, the owners of capital to start thinking long term? I think to a large extent, it's about education, consciousness, and appreciating the link between the macro economy on the one side and asset performance on the other. If you see that there's a link or there's correlation between the two, you'll start thinking long term. Well, I think you need a stick. I think you need a stick. Hang on. Before you give me a stick, let me okay. finish. <laughs> We need to stay. <laughs> but what we've observed in the South African context is that the, the bulk or the majority of asset owners don't fully appreciate the benefit of these long term. That means we need to be educating the asset owners. And in this case, I'm referring to board of pension funds. Very rarely do you have a board of pension fund thinking 10 years. Then it's worsened by our investment advisors who are very short-term in their thinking and they are not very, or not sufficiently innovative for our environment. They would never ever advise you to go and invest in the rural area. So it requires that the board needs to be able to engage with investment advisors at a slightly different level. They need to be able to raise their understanding of what they are doing and be able to make decisions outside of the advice that they are given. Why is the PIC able to do what it's, it's doing today? Thinking long term, investing over a 10 to 20 year horizon? It's because of a principal agent model that understands the benefits of long term. I was just gonna add that it's not just, I mean, we're talking about all of the capital markets, the companies themselves, we need to see some education of board of directors on companies to understand how to integrate environmental, social, and governance excellence. Because I think the vast majority of board directors cannot do this really effectively and articulate their company's specific proposition. So it's very Diana, did you want to come in? It's also quite interesting because for me it's one of trust and confidence. If you have trust and confidence in somebody, you're going to let them go and do what they need to do and guide you. And it often amazes me that when you receive a private equity mandate from an institutional investor, they're completely happy to give you large chunks of money to go and invest, to further invest to create ultimate wealth benefits at the end of the hockey stick effect. But give a same list of equity mandate, and Erica, as you pointed out a little bit earlier, well, I think it was Sandy, you know, one year later, they're comparing performance over the last four quarters and looking at whether you've outperformed or not. And that complete shift of mindset, for me, is a very it's, it's directly a confidence and trust issue. 
And how do we build that in the market? And how do we start creating the relationships we need to between the asset owners and the investment managers? And that, for me, will solve some of that long-term issue. And at Old Mutual, we try to innovate in terms of coming up with new innovative ideas and geographic opportunities. And it's about gaining the confidence of the investors to make that investment. Elias raised, you know, does the average investor have the confidence to go and put money into a township to build a community um, shopping center or the like? No, they don't. And why don't they? Because they don't think they're going to get the return or they don't think the manager can generate the return for them. So again, it's the education of what the historic returns have been, who's been there, who's done that, creating the confidence that you can do it again. And that clearly has to fit in with the mandate aligned to overall goals and objectives based on the liability spectrum as well. So I think what I'm hearing from you all is kind of my next question was going to be, who's going to be the person who starts it off? And I kind of hoped you were going to say, oh, of course, the PRI, because we've got that confidence. Um, People with a stick. So, so Beat myself with a stick? Okay. Beat um, with a stick. The fact of the matter is, is that, you know, we're all, everyone who comes to this conference, or conferences like it, are all part of the same hallelujah chorus. I mean, <laughs> I mean, anybody here against good environmental policy, good governance, etc.? Ah, oh, there's one person there. There's always Mr. one. Lake. <laughs> but the point is, the, the point is, is that somebody with a stick has to set the tone. It's called government. They have to establish sort of universal things, you know, like civil rights and human rights and environmental, you know, appropriate, you know, respect for the environment. Uh, they have to establish appropriate mechanisms like good governance and board requirements and transparency as part of what is mandated for companies to report such that people can then make judgments, intelligent judgments, about those companies. There has to be a leadership on the part of those who, in fact, create and enforce regulation, appropriate regulation, so that the stick, which then will create kind of, hopefully, and even playing here will allow investors to make intelligent choices. Otherwise, it's like taking a dart and throwing it up against a wall. Hopefully, you're going to hit the right company. You need to have information. I, I just have to argue that I think, I think the carrot can actually come first. I think you can take the carrot, build the infrastructure, and then have the stick. All right? The stick is about accountability. The stick is about consistency. But if we do the carrot first, then you can start engaging people. If you have the right infrastructure, then you can uh, deploy your human capital as well as your financial capital for its best and highest purpose. So I think that, yes, the stick has to be there, but that's where you see consistency and that's where you see accountability. But I, I guess I feel like it, it, it's, it's good to try to be kind of aspirational. Well, can I take you back in time? Sure. Hang, hang on a second. Oh, no, no, no. Tabo I wants to ask her a question. You were at UBS. <laughs> How come the UBS analysts on the quarterly calls with companies never ask a sustainability company? Never, ever ask. No, they, How come? They actually do. And well, well, what I would tell I've never you, heard one. let me tell you, okay. you're waiting for the word sustainability. Oh, I don't, you're I don't, not going to get it. All right, don't wait for the word sustainability. The analysts do ask about energy efficiency, human capital engagement, talent productivity, corporate governance, and the ability to have be regulatory compliant. They absolutely do ask these questions. They don't ask, but by the way, there are a lot of them that don't ask any questions on the call because they're going to take their most incisive questions offline. That's the reality. But if you are waiting for everyone to use that language with that word, I call it the S word, sustainability, I think incredibly undermines what we're trying to do. We're talking about business excellence, and we're talking about progressive forward thinking. Um, so, you know, if you wait to hear that question, and by the way, I've heard a number of CEOs say, I never get the question about sustainability. Of course you don't, but you get well, all kinds of questions. if you're a manufacturing firm, you'll ask about energy efficiency. Yeah. All right, and let's but, ask but about the safety track record. Let's yeah. walk, ask about I water efficiency. Okay, guys, I don't, think, I don't okay. think it's ever put into the let's, We're let's running out of time. Let's get a sense for whether or not there is a culture of innovation that drives creativity and productivity and shows the priorities of an organization. Frankly, this is why I became a CEO myself. That's right, you had to leave UBS to do it. 
<laughs> We're going to go there later. We'll do that over here. I guess, I guess a, a couple of points. The first is that uh, Diane made the point that it's, it's all about trust and confidence, and it starts there, and I have to agree with that 100%. The greater the level of trust, confidence uh, between stakeholders, the more um, conducive it is to have the longer term thing. Elias makes the point that, in his experience, asset owners, or not enough asset owners, are, are long term enough in their thinking. Uh, my experience is a little bit different. Um, my experience is, has been that actually the number of asset owners who are long term in their thinking um, it is, is, is greater than one might have, have, have estimated. Um, if I look at, if we, if we use South Africa uh, as an example, and you look at the allocation by asset owners to long term strategies absolute long-term absolute strategies. That allocation is actually pretty significant, about $20 billion and growing. Um, so so I, think, I think that, that asset owners have uh, come to the party in terms of adopting a slightly longer term and a slightly longer horizon to how they approach their investment. Okay. I'm Thanks. conscious of time. We've got five minutes. We let the audience ask a question. I wanted to make two points. One is based on the stick. And why I want to make that point is because I fear the stick. Simply because there are too many sticks you can choose from. Some work, some don't. Going to regulation 101, a regulator is going to regulate if there's bad behavior. If there's good behavior, it will not bother you. So the proposal here is for the private sector or the investment community to lead rather than waiting for regulation to tell them what to do. We have, we've come out of an interesting experience as South Africa of asset prescription, which never went. And if we don't behave in a particular way as the investment community, there's a likelihood for that to come back. So the stick for me is a last option. And just, just to respond to the question of uh, the statistical question, I think in terms of assets, you may be correct. But in terms of numbers of owners of capital having the right mentality, it may be slightly skewed. The last survey that I, I saw, just looking at pension funds only, the last survey I saw shows that only 15% of pension funds in South Africa have an SRI policy. And less than half of that 15% actually has invested in terms of that policy. So that tells you something. I wouldn't bring in the GPF into that picture because it distorts it completely. We're sitting there as well, so. So they can talk for themselves. Okay. But see, by the way, I agree with you. NASDAQ has spent a lot of money creating green indexes that nobody trades. They look pretty. Right, audience time. I think actually what I'd like to hear from the audience is we've heard kind of a bit of discussion about the asset managers saying that the pension schemes aren't doing enough to instigate change. We've had information about maybe it should be regulation and stick. Maybe it's time for some of the pension schemes to defend themselves. So if anybody that's an asset owner or an investor who'd like to kind of say what their problems is about investing long term, then I think it's time to stand up and let yourself be heard. Is there any brave people there? There's a question right at the back. Can you say who you are, please, as Hi. well? Name is Malcolm Gray. I'm from Investec. And I'm afraid I'm an asset manager, not an asset owner. But kind of everything. My, my question is the, the issue of human behavior or human nature. And maybe it's going to the stick issue. We know that tobacco, sugar, and alcohol have some disastrous side effects on society. And governments have woken up to the realities that they need to regulate, and, and sometimes quite sort of penally. The reality is that we are in a situation where the information technology out there today drives uh, information to a point where short-termism is almost a, a, an addictive drug, whether it be what you see on the TV, what you can get on your computer. Is it not time for the regulators to step in to drive long-termism because it's better for us than short-termism? Does anybody want to do a quick response to that? Tobacco regulation? Uh, we're almost out of time, right? Yeah, I actually think intelligent regulation, thoughtful regulation, we heard about it before, is actually critical. That's the infrastructure I talked about, where you start with the stick, but then you need the infrastructure, right? What did Churchill say? We, we build 
our buildings and then thereafter they build us, right? Mm -hmm. So intelligent regulatory regimes are really important. When we think about tobacco, we think about you know the e-cigarettes. So you're getting people off tobacco and the burning of tobacco is the stuff that's very carcinogenic, but they're still getting their nicotine buzz. Is that okay or not? Are we creating a new problem or not? But every kind of regulatory regime has unintended consequences and we just have to be very thoughtful. But you know, reasonable regulation um, I think is, is you know, a necessary, uh, whether it's a necessary evil, but it's, it's necessary in very complex environments. By the way, everyone talked about water and energy. It's not water and energy here, and that water and energy, water policy is critical in the context of energy policy. You can't extract these things. These are very complex. It's the same with regulation. You have to look at everything all at the same time, which is why this is hard. What we're doing is really hard. It's like with diversity, diversity on board. This is hard. It's messy. It's painful. But it does come out with better outcomes and better results if you can do it right. And it starts with transparency. Starts with integrated reporting. Unfortunately, uh, it's not going to work on a voluntary basis. It really needs to be. I mean, let me just conclude the last thing I'll say on Trump. When I grew up, I used to worship an American politician named Robert Kennedy. And he would conclude all of his campaign speeches by quoting George Bernard Shaw. Uh, and he would say, There are two kinds of men that look at the world in that person. Uh, kind of person that looks at the world and asks why. I dream of things that never were and ask why not. I think we have to look at the why not. We have to ask why we can't get integrated reporting. We can't, why we can't get stock exchanges and regulators to require transparency in these issues and would come in the form of listing requirements. Does anybody else in the panel want to comment on that or should we have another question? Another question? Last question? Can you fight it out between you who's going to ask? Yeah, have a mic. Just to take Rob's question. Thank you very much. I'm Umar Giri from the Metro Industries Fund. Um, when I'm sitting here and listening to you, I'm thinking. Can't hear you speak up. Most of the funds are different. Some are old, some are young. Uh, members, so funds are not always the same. But yes, if a fund doesn't think long term, then that fund, those trusts must look at themselves because retirement is about long term. But the question I am asking: if we use a stick, and that investment goes wrong, who's responsible for it? Government or the trustees? Question about sticks going wrong. Anybody? Yeah. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, those are the ills of regulation. Um, often, when an economy is doing well, the private sector does not want to be regulated. When things go wrong in the economy, they want the government to be close. So half the time, the regulator is always playing a balance. And you're right. If there's asset prescription, for instance, we choose that stick and the pension funds go down, government will be blamed. And if government does not make do, there'll be a riot. So it is very important that as you think about regulation, you think about the unintended consequences. And one of those is the failure of regulation. So we need to be tread very carefully when you talk about regulation. This is why I said, I hear the stick. I, I, I understand that, but the question is, what is the stick? Uh, if the stick is prescriptions on how you should invest or what you should invest or where you should invest, that's one kind of regulation. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about transparency. I'm talking about integrated reporting. Put it all out there. Let the, then let the consumer, the investor, decide. You need to have adequate transparency. Right now, we, transparency as we define it, or regulation, is burdensome. I think we have to look at the whole scheme. But giving people information about what your governing structure is, the amount of energy that you consume, what your labor policies are, 
There's no blame in that. There actually should be blame for failure to have that. Let's try and tie the session up. I'm seeing someone waving at me and there's something flashing over there. What I wanted to just do very quickly, we're talking 10 words, is each of you, can you make a commitment for the next year to make the minister happy on how we're going to move the agenda forward on bringing ahead long-termism? Start from this end. We have a very clear focus of actually delivering outcomes that we promise. So for me, if I can build the trust and confidence with my investors, they will have more confidence to place funds long-term with long-term goals and mandates. And that in itself creates almost a flywheel of ensuring that we start shifting away from the lack of confidence, which drives short-term views, to an environment of confidence in terms of being able to meet objectives and knowing that managers will deliver on those objectives. And they're very clearly, I need Sandy to ensure that his short-term also doesn't prejudice my long-term beta because that will have an impact on meeting my goals and objectives. Right. One other comment just on regulation. For me, I often see regulation as a limit. And it's the stick that limits the opportunity the carrot creates. And if the carrot creates an environment where people want to do things, you will have the transparency and the long-termism. And if managers, particularly investment managers, can innovate, they will create the opportunities which are the carrots that can be planted to allow long-termism to thrive and to grow. And for me, that's one of the challenges we take on, is how innovative can we be? How can we open up other opportunities, which makes it a no-brainer in terms of long-term investing? OK, thank you. Tim, you won't. Um, <laughs> Eddie. Uh, simply is to continue leading by doing. What do I mean by that? What we have been able to show over the past while is that undoing economic bottlenecks is one of the most critical long-term interventions that a country can consider. Investing in the basic infrastructure that gets the economy to be more productive, more labor adoptive, and more competitive. Fantastic. Last words? Sure. Investor asset management started thinking long-term about 22, 22 years ago, <laughs> in 1991. And, and we're fortunate over the last 22 years to have built relationships characterized by trust and confidence where clients actually do give us the space, the freedom, the horizon to, to grow money for them. Uh, and so I think the long-term thinking is something that, that isn't new, uh, isn't, isn't going to happen over the next 12 months. It's something that's been around for, for decades. Fantastic. Very quickly, last words. I've committed to driving, the, again, an investment bank that's intent on kind of accelerating the velocity of money as it relates to the financing of enterprises that are pursuing environmental, social, and governance excellence. So capitalism for what it was meant to do. Fantastic. Last words, Sandy? Well, my goal, I guess, would be to abandon the stick and replace it with a prop. The pride would be to get the uh, working with my colleagues at other exchanges like the South African Stock Exchange and Bovesta to get more transparency in the marketplace by getting universal standards, listing standards, and transparency. Just remember, if we had transparency, the world would not be in the economic shape it is. It was lack of regulation on swaps and other products that got us to our economic. Okay, so we'll all report back in 12 months' time in the next PLI in person. Can we thank our panelists, please? Thank you very much. Thank you.